How's it going, guys? We're back for another episode of Off the Pitch, and today we'll be talking about Manchester City finally becoming crowned as champions. Fulham and West Brom have officially been relegated, and the possibility of Liverpool and Juventus being in the Europa League, and Arsenal not having any European football at all. We'll be talking about that and a little bit more right after this. Okay, everyone, we're going to kick the show off with Manchester City being crowned as the Premier League champions of 2020-2021 after Manchester United have lost to Leicester City. It's kind of a throwaway game for Manchester United today. They didn't really give give a rat's behind, and they just threw it away, really, and let Leicester win and gave City the crown. Um, was it inevitable to you? Did you see this coming throughout the whole season? Uh, it definitely came apparent to me fairly early on. Uh, they looked to be a, a very dominant side from the get-go, although they didn't necessarily show it in the record. Uh, they were a bit further down the table for a bit, but their issue was not the defense, which we've seen in past years has been the one weakness for City. It was their lack of scoring, and you knew that was going to come. Uh, and it looked like they might have some competition on that battle. It looked like Chelsea, Tottenham, Manchester United might be able to give them the run. Manchester United hit their best form a bit too late. Tottenham fell off, and Chelsea had a rough run before Tuchel came in, and inevitably that just led to City being at the top. Liverpool just dealt with way too many injuries issues this year for them to be competitive, and so it ultimately led to them just having a comfortable round of the title. And as far as their lineup and their roster just goes, they've stayed arguably the healthiest among some of the top teams this season, which in this season more than any other has played such a massive part. And their overall talent on the roster is just so vital. The signing of Ruben Diaz was so important for that back line to become one of the best back lines we've seen in recent years in the Premier League. And along with that and all the amazing attacking options they have up top, even without the play of Aguero and Gabriel Jesus for a lot of the season, they still managed to put in so many goals with the likes of De Bruyne and Sterling and Mares and Phil Foden, who really emerged even more so this season. That was a very dominant season for Man City and a very well earned title from them. Yeah, for sure. I predicted City to win this title from the get-go, and I didn't expect them to have such a shaky start as we saw at the start of the season with Tottenham and Chelsea starting to run away with it, and United catching up, and then City had a rough start, like I said, and they picked it up midway through the season after Kevin De Bruyne got back, and without Sergio Aguero through most of the season and adapting with a false nine, which was very impressive for Pep Guardiola, might I say. I usually criticize his tactical awareness and his coaching ability, but he's really changed it up, didn't play with a striker, dropped the false nine back. He's used many players in that position. Bernardo Silva, Jesus very rarely. He's used the likes of De Bruyne, Phil Foden, Sterling once in a while, and he's really adapted. He's played very well, and we usually criticize the back line, but they've, the back line's been phenomenal. Like you said, the signing room at DS has really solidated into that. And John Stones has stepped in and been the number two right beside him. Everyone expected him to say, yeah, we need that guy besides Laporte. Laporte's our guy. He's been commanding. He's a great captain. He knows what he's up to. He knows what he's going to do. And they got the left footer with Laporte. And Laporte's been the number three, which I never would have expected. John Stones, heavily criticized by a lot of England fans all the time. And this year he's just stepped up and he's taken that role, which everyone thought he would be taking once he joined City. And he's really been unbelievable, John Stones. Everyone's been praising Ruben Diaz, but I think you got to look at John Stones a bit. And I think him and McGuire are going to make a fantastic partnership in England. But City's back line has been phenomenal with the likes of Kyle Walker back there too. Ederson's been great. Seen Stefan from US a bit there too. And Rodri, I think, does not get enough credit from them. Everyone talks about Fabinho, Conte. I think Rodri's probably been arguably one of the best defensive midfielders in the world this year behind maybe Kimmich or Conte. And Rodri's just been phenomenal without him. I don't think you win this title. I don't think the defense is as solid without him. He's been there, Fernandinho. Everyone thought it's good. When you get a new center defensive midfielder, it's always a bit of a, a change or a tough transition. And they made it really seamless bringing in Rodri and just working him in. And they're probably going to sign Fernandinho to an extra contract. But yeah, City, City have really ran away with this. It's maybe only a 10-point gap between United, but it really hasn't been. It could have been closer, but it really wasn't. United didn't really have the team. Everyone expected Chelsea to challenge, Tottenham to challenge. Didn't pan out that way. And it was really really City's for the taking without a striker, which is unbelievable that they won without a striker. 
And we're going to move on to our next topic here. We've got Fulham and West Brom have officially been relegated to the championship. What are your thoughts? Did you see them going straight back down? From West Brom specifically, uh, there was no chance in my mind that they were going to be staying up with the level of quality they had on that on that roster. Uh, there was never enough talent there to indicate that they were going to be able to stay up unless they were just a structurally sound team, uh, like we saw with Sheffield last year, with some good coaching. And that's just not something you see very often. They weren't really set up that way. Their midfield was not anywhere near strong enough to be able to play the way they wanted to play early on. And then, of course, they brought in Big Sam in the middle of the season. And he wasn't able to do enough with them either. And th 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 there really just wasn't enough talent on this roster, simply put. Uh, the, the signings weren't made that were necessary to keep them up. And it was fairly inevitable to me that this team was always going to go down. Uh, as far as Fulham goes, I thought they might have had a bit more of a chance. Uh, they had a bit of Premier League experience on the roster with a lot of these players being on the team a couple of years ago from when they got sent back, back down initially. And they had a bit more continuity. They didn't bring in as many players this year, so they still kept a bit of chemistry. Uh, but inevitably there wasn't enough. They didn't have as good of a striker as they did with Mitrovic when they came up a couple of years back, which helped them be a little bit closer to try and avoid that relegation zone. Uh, but they, they just ultimately didn't have enough on that end. And so as far as seeing them come back up, it, it'll, of course, as, as with any team, we'll just have to see who stays and who goes. But Fulham and West Brom for the last few years now just seem like those types of teams that might kind of join the likes of Norwich to just kind of bounce up and down. I think if anyone is likely to stay, I think Fulham has shown in the past that they are willing to spend money, uh, and whereas West Brom have been a lot more reluctant. And so I think if we're likely to see any of those two come back, I think we'll like to see Fulham sooner than we're likely to see West Brom. But of course, there's a lot that remains to be seen with that. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you on both topics here. I think West Brom were inevitable. They're always going to go straight back down. To bring in a guy like Big Sam, I don't think he had enough time. But for even a guy like Big Sam not to be able to save your club and keep them up, usually he can work his magic and keep a club like that up. He's done it many, many, many times now. And the fact that he didn't have the quality on that team to keep them up is kind of embarrassing to the club because he's been able to do it with many sides and he couldn't do it with West Brom. And I wasn't really surprised, sadly, for Big Sam. I didn't think it was a job he should have taken to ruin his reputation. But like I agree with you, they were going to go down anyways. And then Fulham. Fulham, I, I really like Scott Parker as a manager. I think he's fantastic. The football he plays, playing out of the, out of the back, very attacking style based. But he just didn't really have the players he wanted to play his style of football. He had a great, great goalkeeper in Areola. He didn't really have a fast striker he could play with until he got Joshua Maja up top. And that was really too late for him unfortunately, to work him into the system. They had some quality players, like you said. They had some Premier League experience out there and some really good players. But like you said, if one of them are going to bounce up, it's definitely going to be Fulham. They're going to spend money. They got the coach, got Parker, if he wants to stay, or maybe he'll join the Premier League side. If he stays, I think he'll stay. They'll come straight back up. They got this quality of side. Some players leave me on loan, but I think they can do it. And moving on to another championship player right now, could be coming up this next season in the playoff system, and that is Ivan Tony. We're going to talk about him briefly. He has broken the scoring record in the championship, scoring 31 goals, breaking the championship record. What do you think of Ivan Tony's season so far, and you think he'll maybe move on? I think it's absolutely amazing to see someone who's been breaking all of these championship records in his first season of the championship coming up from League One last season and now just making the step up absolutely seamlessly a uh, very comfortable transition for him was strong from the get-go and just got better and better as the season went on his scoring ability uh, along with the playmaking as well i believe really ended around 10 assists on the season a very complete striker with very good pace and good height it's everything that you want in, in a striker and it's, it's we're really gonna have to wait and see how these playoffs go of course brentford are in that third spot they're going to be the top team going into these playoffs and they'll be hoping to get through via the playoffs again this season as opposed to last year where they ultimately lost but hopefully they can win and if they do win i wouldn't be surprised to see him stay along on that brantford roster but i have no doubt if they don't and brantford are back in the championship again next season that we will see him move on to a premier league club yeah exactly He's such a young english talent we talked about him earlier on the show times him going maybe to Leicester which is very interesting but like if he doesn't get promoted with Brentford he's a very young talented English center forward very tall very quick and getting behind very good scoring in front of goal and he's just brilliant in front of goal so we're scoring 31 goals in the championship one of the hardest leagues in the world everyone talks about 
and he's done it in his first season. And it's been a seamless transition going away from Ollie Watkins and Ben Rama and going to Ivan Tony. And it's really been seamless. He's got 31 goals, like we say, and he's been unbelievable. And like you said, if he doesn't come up with Brentford in the playoffs, which is very likely that he could, then he'll stay with Brentford. We, I could easily see him staying with Brentford, playing it out there, seeing what he does next year. And if they don't make it, he could definitely come back to a Premier League side. Was used, used to be with Newcastle. I can't see him going there. But he could definitely go to a top side in the Premier League. I think he's got the quality. And hopefully they get promoted with Brentford because I'd love to see what he can do at Brentford. And Brentford look like a really young, quality attacking side. Before we wrap up this break, we're going to move on to Juventus and Liverpool and a bit of Arsenal. Juventus and Liverpool are currently sitting in Europa League spots. Everyone's criticized Manchester United once in a while for being in Europa League. They've criticized Chelsea, Arsenal, and now you're getting two big dogs in Europe, Liverpool and Juventus. Juventus currently sits fifth in Serie A, and Liverpool currently sits sixth in the Premier League. Do you think these teams will stay in Euro- Europa League, and what do you think this means for the squads going into next season? I think for Liverpool, it's obviously been a tough scenario for them this year with all of the injuries they've had, specifically to their back line. Uh, they, they have played a little bit better in the last couple of weeks after a bit of a rough spell. But I think at this point, it's going to be tough to see their way into the top four. Leicester picking up another win today, as you mentioned, against Manchester United just makes that even harder. Having to make up ground on Leicester and Chelsea now, it's going to be tough for them. They do have a game in hand on Chelsea, but it's going to be tough for them to make up that ground at this point in the season. And I, if the odds to say and if I had to say it's more likely they end up in the Europa League at this point for Juventus they do have a chance they are three points back and they do have the goal goal differential advantage and so there's definitely a chance that they can sneak in but they've been largely inconsistent throughout this season and it's going to be hard to say it's there hasn't been a consistent run of play that you expect from Juve specifically in the league there hasn't been any dominance on the attacking end and what like you would expect with the players they have, with the likes of Dybala and Ronaldo and even some of the younger players in Chiesa and Kluzevsky in that league, you would think they should be able to do a little bit more, and they just haven't. It hasn't been the UV we've expected to see over the last couple of seasons. And so it's really, really weird, but an interesting dynamic to see the likes of Liverpool and Juventus in the Europa League next season. It would definitely bring a bit more of a spotlight and an intrigue to the, to the competition. You have more fans of some bigger clubs in the with my eyes on that competition. And then, of course, you never know who gets sent down from the Champions League into the Europa League. And some more spotlight onto that tournament and more entry into that competition is never a bad thing. Yeah, for sure. That tournament is definitely going to have some more intrigue. It's going to be more entertaining with the likes of Juventus, Liverpool. I definitely don't see Liverpool making Champions League anymore with the likes of last year picking up a win today, making that gap even harder for them to close. Even though they have a game in hand, I just don't see them doing it. And you have Juventus, like you said, three points off of gold differential on their side against AC Milan. That's going to be very interesting, but they have been very shaky, very up and down, like you did say. Pirlo's had a very tough first season. He's had a lot of quality there. It's his first time managing. I'm not surprised that it hasn't gone exactly to plan. I didn't see them winning the league. They have a very aging squad and a very young squad at the same time. And a lot of these players could leave, like the likes of Ronaldo, Dybala could leave too. Guys like that don't want to be playing in the Europa League. They're Champions League caliber players, and they want to be playing where they need to be playing to get the big bucks, to be playing and winning the right trophies. But to say that same thing there, if they do make the Europa League, Europa League uh, competition would be very interesting with possibly Everton and Liverpool or West Ham and Liverpool, and you still got Juventus. And you got, I can't remember who's, Dortmund might be even get knocked down into Europa League too. You never know what's going to happen in Bundesliga right now. And you got the likes of, like you said, the teams falling down from the Champions League, which is always some quality sides coming down there. So you can see some great teams in Europa League this next next coming year. You saw some great teams in there this year, but I think next year is going to be double the amount of teams that are going to be of quality in there. It's not going to be your pub sides around Europe, even though those are fun to see, like your Dynamo Zagreb's. But this is going to be even better than what we've seen this year. And I hope we can see Juventus and Liverpool knock down the Europa League because it'll make the competition even more exciting. We'll talk about a transfer rundown right after this. (music) 
Okay, guys, we're back with a transfer talk, transfer rundown, whatever you guys want to call it. But we're going to start with an English player and an English club, Jaden Sancho. It's been quite heavily talked about last year. He agreed personal terms, but let Dortmund won $120 million, Manchester United stayed firm on $80 million, and deal never got made. But right now, Dortmund have dropped their asking price to $85 million to $90 million, and it's talks that Manchester United are willing to put a bid in around $80 million to $85 million. Do you believe that to be true? And do you see Jaden Sancho joining Manchester United this offseason? I think there's definitely a lot more willingness from Dortmund to sell him this summer. I think last summer they were a lot more reluctant, uh, as we saw with that $120 million asking fee. Uh, I, I think it became pretty apparent early on that Manchester United weren't going to reach that, and Dortmund didn't really seem very willing to reduce that price, move below that $120 million asking price. But obviously now things have changed with the likes of the pandemic and money is a bit of a different issue. And so they seem to be a little bit more willing to accrue some funds out of Sancho and of course, Berlin Holland as well this summer. And so I guess the question really becomes within the Manchester United organization is do they want to fork out that money for Jaden Sancho or do they think that Mason Greenwood is going to be the guy there for them at that right wing spot and that they want to continue to develop him at that position. That's really just going to depend on what the internal management wants. I think the move is going to be a Jaden Sancho purchase, if I had to guess, and I think that would be the smart decision if I had to guess it. Mason Greenwood's finishing is just so lethal. I think his future has to be in more of a finishing role, not that you can't be as a winger, but I think as a finishing in front of that and his poise at that position is just too great not to be someone who's a central attacker. And so I think this fit, of, fit and signing of Jaden Sancho makes sense within this Manchester United team. Yeah, for sure. Manchester United definitely need a right winger. They need a central defensive midfielder and a center back. They're definitely going to get one of those three or two of those three, maybe. But there's been a big surprise out of the camp saying there's going to be a big surprise coming to Manchester United this summer because the Glazers know that United needs something for them to rekindle their relationships with the fans after the Super League, the riots, uh, the protests and everything going on for decades with the Glazers and the Glazers need to somehow rekindle the relationship with the fans. And it's either going to be a Sancho or Declan Rice or Raphael Varane signing. It's got to be a big splash and they know they got to make one of them to try to get the fans with signing. And I think it's got to be Jaden Sancho. They want that marquee guy, the guy who's going to sell jerseys, the guy who's going to score the goals, get assists. And I think you're right. I think it's going to be Jaden Sancho joining Manchester United this summer. I think United's going to hold firm and get that 80 million. Dortmund feel they need to sell. I don't think Sancho feels like he wants to leave. It's looked quite clear, uh, quite clear with how he's played and how his body movement has been and how he's been in the media. And I think he wants to leave and go back to England. He kind of wanted to do that last summer, but then Manchester United fell through on that. And I think you got other teams involved in this deal too now. Chelsea maybe, probably not as much as they were last summer. And you still got Liverpool. I think Liverpool is a heavy contestant in this now too joining Manchester United in this. And I think he does go to Manchester United because we really need that right wing spot filled. And like you said, Mason Greenwood is a shoe-in to play striker behind Edinson Cavani next year. And Mar Martial looks like he might leave eventually. And Cavani's obviously only going to stay for a year. So that looks perfect for Mason Greenwood to step in. And hopefully he's going to be prepared after Cavani leaves and once Jaden Sancho joins him this offseason. We're going to move to Juventus and legend, icon, whatever you want to call him, Gigi Buffon, Gianluigi Buffon, is set to leave this summer from Juventus. He's 42, 43, around that age. He is quite up there in age. And I'm not surprised he's going to leave. He could have stayed. He's been a third goalkeeper or even a second backup. But he's set to leave. And... I personally don't know really where he's going to go, where he's going to end up. Probably some Italian side, probably won't go back to PSG, or he'll retire. Where do you think he'll end up, or where would you like to see him go? I think from what the little I know of Gianluigi Buffon and what he'll want at this point in time in his career, I, I wouldn't be surprised to just see him find a club where he can get, get his best chance at winning a Champions League title. That's something he's been chasing for a long time, and it's obviously something he wants. And so I think that's something that he will try and strive for in this next move, if that is what he wants to do. But it's also very possible that we see him retire as well. Of course, as you mentioned, he is now in his 40s. He is definitely not a spring chicken anymore. And he's not exactly getting a ton of playing time. He's much more there for a backup for 
locker room purposes, that leadership, that experience that he will bring to a team and the benefits that that has that just don't get mentioned about or you don't see on the pitch. But I don't think we're going to see him go somewhere that is a weak side. Uh, I would expect he goes and performs as a backup for a team that can compete in the Champions League so he can try and get himself some more trophies. Um, or, as, as I mentioned, it's very possible we see him retire as well. It's, it's, it's really just an up-in-the-air thing every year now for GM Luke and Buffon. But I think those are the two possibilities for him moving forward. Yeah, definitely. He's either going to be... For me, he's either going to retire and become maybe a backroom staff at Juventus. I don't see him joining anywhere as a staff or backroom at anything besides Juventus or in Italy because he's just born and bred Juventus. And I could definitely see him going uh, going to retirement, like you said, and becoming a goalkeeper coach for Juventus or just becoming your backroom staff. Or the other end of the spectrum, like you said, joining some team as a second or third string goalkeeper and going and winning a Champions League. But that's really just a guess and hope that you pick the right team and you choose the right team. He thought PSG was going to do it when he joined PSG. That didn't happen when United upset them. And he's really just going to, if he wants to win a Champions League, he's got to throw a shoe in the hat and hope he chooses the right team. Because I think he's got to choose a team in the Prem. And I don't really see him going to England. So it's really going to be interesting to see what GM Luigi Buffon chooses for his path of his career at this age of his uh, career, like I said, and it's going to be interesting to see what he does because, he's, like you said, he's no spring chicken. He's in his 40s. So it's going to be really interesting to see what he does. We're going to move on to Spain and a young Ajax midfielder. Yes, it's not De Jong. It's not Matthias De Litt anymore, who was talked about in Barcelona years ago. And Bar- or Sergino Dest, even, another Ajax player. The Ajax players love to go to Barcelona. And here's another guy who's been mentioned, Ryan Gravenberch. To Barcelona, his market value is around 28 million. There hasn't been much talk of a fee. I haven't heard much of anything like that. But his market value is around 28 million. Barcelona are really strapped for cash. They're going to sign Messi more than likely this off season. Do you think he'll go there? Seeing that uh, De Jong's there, Sergino Dest's there, think any kind of connections going to happen? I think it definitely makes sense from the the, the Ajax and the Dutch perspective, no doubt. Uh, of course, with Alan Coleman being there. And as you mentioned, he had De Jong and Guest there as well. There's definitely a lot of connections there that make sense from uh, an, an integration of a new young player. It always helps when you have someone that can connect with that player that has a former relationship already with that player in their playing career. It definitely makes that transition a lot easier and makes a lot more sense to bring in a young player. But as you mentioned, Barcelona obviously are in a very tough time financially right now. But it makes sense for them if they are going to want to start young and start building up a new young dose of players that they are going to be interested in grabbing birch it really just depends on what their mindset is if they want to start bringing in a few more veteran players to start bringing up their quality right now or if they sense they're at a point in time where messi is at the back end of his career and they want to start bringing in young talent so that in a couple of years time hopefully their financial situation is a bit better and when messi moves on they can bring in a star player to then and have these young players developed for when that new system and that new style of Barcelona comes in at that point. Of course, then Messi could be gone. Sergio Busquets could very well be gone. There could be a lot of changes within Barcelona at that point. And so bringing in some new players to start this new era of FC Barcelona, Barcelona soccer definitely makes sense. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Bringing in young talent like Gravenberg to play alongside De Jong, I think they both perfectly fit Barcelona DNA, pass and move, tiki tack kind of style. And to bring in young talent, like you said, you got to go young eventually. And we've seen it bits by bits in this season with Barcelona, like Sir Ricky Puj, Sergino Desk, uh, Mengueza, going very young. And you would have seen Ansu Fati more if he didn't get injured. And they got a very good young side, Barcelona. And if they can keep going young like this and keep bringing more young talent, they got a bright future. And you got to move on from Messi, Busquets, PK, Ter Stegen eventually. And if they can start doing that slowly, one by one, each season, integrating the young players, it's going to work even better for them. And like you've seen in Madrid, Real Madrid haven't done that at all. They're still very, very old. 30-plus is most of the starting lineup. Casemiro, Modric, Cruz, Benzema, the likes of Sergio Ramos, and they're, uh, Carvajal. They just got an old team. And Real Madrid haven't started to do the rotation like Barcelona have. And Barcelona have done it very well, I'd have to say. Didn't look so good the year before, but this year looked very good. Hopefully they can continue on that run. We got two, three weird kind of transfers that have been happening. Two official and one that's pretty well certain. 
We're going to talk about a Mexican transfer, but he's not Mexican. Florian Tovan is transferring from Marseille. He was going to become a free agent this summer. His contract is going to be up. But he has denied some contracts some big clubs around Europe, some European competitions, top five leagues, to go into the CONCACAF and join El Tigres in Mexico. Kind of uh, really left field kind of transfer here from Florian Tovan. What do you make of this one? Uh, I this was a really weird transfer. Like I saw, I saw this one, and it was like, okay. And so, why? Like, why would a guy who's in the French league, who's played very well in the French league for Marseille, has played on European competition and played very well, and now I'm 28 years old, I'm in my prime, and I'm going to go play with Gignac in the Mexican league? Like, unless they're trying to form the next great French duo in the Mexican league, which isn't hard because that's never been a thing. I don't, I don't know what the objective is here from Florian Tovan. He's probably not chasing money because he's probably making less money here. He's not chasing any type of legacy or success. It's, it's Mexico. Uh, family or personal related, there's less safety here. But nothing about this transfer makes sense to me in any which way unless him and Jignac have some relationship that this is unbeknownst to us. Uh, nothing about it makes sense to me. Is it something that just completely threw me off? especially when we heard that there was other European clubs that were interested in him. It, it just doesn't make sense on any level. Yeah, it's, it's me and you both heard about it at the same time. It's a very odd, very weird move. It's not like he's going to the CSL and making more money. He's going to the Mexican League. The Mexican League has never been known for anything. If you would have went to the MLS, sure, maybe I understand that a bit more. Going to play for Inter Miami, maybe, LA Galaxy, going to some nice weather playing for a fun club in the MLS, having a good time. But going to El Tigres in Mexico, like you said, for family, you're not as safe as you would be in France probably. You're maybe you got you got way better weather than in France. That's maybe the only positive. I just don't understand why he'd be making this transfer. Like you said, he's in his prime. He's maybe he won't score eight goals this year, big deal. Maybe change new scenery to a different club in Europe. Maybe been better for him, but I don't understand what he's doing here. It, it's baffling. Maybe we'll get some more news before next week and we'll have some more talking points for you on that one. But it's it's a very left field transfer. Two more here before the break. We're going to go to Ryan Bertrand, who for Fabrizio Romano has tweeted, is set to leave Southampton this summer. And it's very odd because he's usually the starting left back game in, game out. He is a lot of experience for England, a lot of experience for Southampton, Premier League experience, played for Chelsea's Youth Academy. Everyone does. And he's gone to Southampton many years and now he's said he's going to leave which is very odd i would have never expected this where would you see him going i don't see him anywhere outside of england he doesn't strike me as someone especially at this age that's going to be going anywhere and of course he's not young anymore he is now 31 he'll be 32 in august but i just i don't suspect that he would drop outside of the premier league he's not an elite left back anymore but he's still definitely someone that can play in the premier league and be a starting left back or if he wants to go to a top-end club, he can be a quality backup left back for someone, whether that means he wants to go play on a, a bottom, more closer to the bottom table club, maybe someone at the quality of Newcastle or Brighton, although of course Brighton don't often use fullbacks and Newcastle have Jamal Lewis, but someone in around that type of quality or a newly promoted team next season if they have interest, or maybe at this point in time, he is a bit more interested in some trophies and he wants to go be a backup for someone. Who that is, I don't know. There's not exactly a ton of teams that need a ton of left-back depth right now amongst the top teams other than maybe Tottenham. But I don't see him leaving the Premier League. Uh, He definitely seems like a Premier League quality player to me, and I don't see him outside of England. But it's definitely interesting to not see him on Southampton anymore after being such a crucial part of their defense for so many years. Yeah, it's going to be weird to see him leave Southampton. And like I said, being such a crucial part in that Southampton team, at Southampton back line. He's been such a big part of that team. And to see him leave is going to be very weird, very different to see him go. I completely agree with you. He's going to probably join a mid-table, the bottom-table club, probably a promotion side. I think he could really be a good, experienced player for them because he's still a very quality player, like you said. Joining maybe a Brentford if they get promoted would be fantastic, I think, for him. Or maybe in Norwich because Norwich like to, don't really like to splash much cash. So if you go for a free agent like... Ryan Bertrand, after they lost Jamal Lewis last year. I could see that fitting perfectly, and hopefully he finds the right transfer because I would hate to see him leave the Premier League. He's such a fun player to watch. 
and he's entertaining even in the press conference. But the last one we're going to talk about, it's actually in a basically almost 99.9% official transfer, probably official by next week, Bubakari Sumare from Lost Lille in the French League, currently leading the league in first place. And he's agreed personal terms back in January to join Leicester City. And Fabrizio tweeted that it is less than 30 million fee between the clubs. It is not official, official, but it's basically, like I said, 99.9%. What do you make of this transfer for Leicester City and Lost Lille? Well, first off, I think I just need to mention how many good youth players have come out of Lost Lille in the last few years. It's crazy. I and mean, of course, years ago, we had the likes of Eden Hazard, we've had Pepe, Jonathan David is now there, Gabrielle is there, who's now gone to Arsenal. Tumari now on his way to Leicester, and of course, Baltman's had a good year there, who replacing Gabrielle. So many good young talents that come out of Lost Quill do a great job of developing young players there. And I think Sumari could do very, very well for Leicester. Uh, very good midfield depth for them. Of course, now as they ho- hope to hold on to that Champions League position for this coming season, they're going to need that depth and quality depth, as you don't always need that high level of quality in the Europa League, especially until the later rounds where some of those opponents are a bit weaker. But if their ambition is to do well in the Premier League and the Champions League next season, in addition into the midfield, is going to be very important for them, specifically someone that can give Ndidi a bit of a break, as Ndidi is just such a workhorse for this team. He's one of the most underrated players in the Premier League, in my opinion, such a great center defensive midfielder. He's also played the center back for them this year a bit when they've had some injuries. Such a versatile, good player for them. And I think having someone that can give him a bit of a break and play some center defensive midfielder minutes for them is going to be very valuable. Yeah, getting a guy of Pubakari Smore's quality in at his age, I think he's 20, 21. He's such a young, talented player. Like you said, lots of talent coming out of Lost Little. Even the likes of Nicolas Pepe and Renato Sanchez is still there. They've, they've got a beautiful youth academy. And to bring in a guy like Pubakari Smore to start ahead of Yuri Tielemans or start ahead of Ndidi in rotational games or even big games when you need him to come in as a sub or bring him on as a defensive player late in the game. He's fantastic. It's at, at his age for a guy, maybe $25 million, it, It's you can't get much more of a steal, and, a t- and you wouldn't have expected less from a team like Leicester to make such a brilliant move in the transfer market and to be so early on it before anybody else is to get get the deal basically done in January, and we're all, almost at the end of May before before they've got it done and transfer window isn't even open, and they already almost have their first signing, which is unbelievable. And we would never expect less from Leicester City. And... That ends up our transfer talk and transfer roundup for this week. We're going to head into our Premier League awards for this year, right after this. Well, Sky Sports have done their Premier League awards. Gary Neville and Jamie Carragher both gave out their awards this past weekend. So we're going to do exactly the same. and Our, t- our awards are going to be the signing of the season, manager of the season, player of the season, defender, attacker, midfielder of the season, and young player of the season to wrap up our show. We will start with, I think, the easiest one, probably the manager of the season. There could be some controversy here. We'll see what you have to say. I think I went for an outside show, but we'll go with yours first. Uh, I think there's two guys for me that I definitely had to consider for this. One, of course, being Pat Guardiola, who led Manchester City to the title of the season. But I think, secondly, David Moyes definitely has to have a shout here as well, who brought West Ham to one of their best seasons in a long time, pushing them in a Champions League spot run, and at the least, hopefully, a Europa League spot. This is something West Ham have hoped to do in a while. Of course, a couple of years ago, they had their big spending spree when they brought in Philippe Anderson, and it didn't really work that season. But this year, they've definitely had a much better season. And it's definitely gone well for them. Declan Rice and Susatch has been so great for them in the midfield. Who Falls has been very good for them as an addition at right back. This has worked very well for them this season, and a lot of credit has to go there. And I think that is where my manager of the season has to go. Of course, a great shout-out to Pep Guardiola as well. He did very well at the Manchester City side. But I think it has to go to David Moyes for me in West Ham, who had a very good season, a season that was much better than I was certainly expecting out of this West Ham side. Yeah, I thought we were going to have some controversy here, but yeah, I was going to give my shout-out to Pep Guardiola, and I gave mine to David Moyes, too. Uh, he's coming for a second stint at the club. No one really thought he was going to do so well. West Ham have been a team floundering around relegation, kind of flirting with it, kind of mid-table kind of club, and he's really made some f- fantastic signings, brought them all the way up to, like you said, Champions League run, and maybe still could get in Champions League 
as we've seen Leicester City have kind of dropped off of late. Easy win against Manchester United is basically youth academy or third string team. But Leicester could still drop off. West Ham could slid in there. But David Moyes has been fantastic. He had kind of a rough stint in Spain, kind of came back. He's done really extremely well here with West Ham, keeping them up last year and doing unbelievable and turning them around to bring them into Champions League spot. And the likes of, like you mentioned, Suchek and Dave, um, Declan Rice. And he's also signed uh, Sofian Kufal, who's been an unbelievable signing right back. Could be a shout for signing of the season. I won't go that far, but I think he's been unbelievable. I think he'd be at least someone's top five. I th- I'd put him at one of my top two right backs, at least in the season. He's been unbelievable as, as a Czech international besides his teammate, Thomas Suchek. You have the likes of another fantastic signing in Jesse Lingard. David Moyes has absolutely resurrected a guy like Jesse Lingard. Lingard needed some confidence, some morale boosting, and David Moyes has really given it to him And as he didn't get into match United. And it really shows David Moyes' tactical skills, his man management, and he sums it up for both of our Manager of the Season awards. So I guess we agreed on that one, and we'll move on to probably one of the easier awards. Hopefully I'm saying this one. Defender of the Season. Who do you got? Uh, it's going to be Ruben Diaz for me. For someone to be this young, that have no Premier League experience, of course, played over with Benfica in the Portuguese League, who have produced many good center backs over the years, most notably David Luiz. And of course, like, this is just it's unheard of for anyone to transition to the Premier League this well in their first season, never mind a young center back like, getting used to the country, the language, the style of game, all in the middle of the pandemic to come in and play this well and absolutely lead this Manchester City defense one of their best defensive records in club history is, is just something that I totally did not expect. And it definitely made their their well worth on their 65 or 70 million they spent on Ruben Diaz. And he has to be the defender of the year for me. Yeah, this is pretty uh, set in stone one for both of us, I think. I have Ruben Diaz too, but I want to give a shout out to uh, by far of second place for me would be Luke Shaw. I think his career has been absolutely resurrected this year. Left back probably of the – top five leagues, top uh, left back in the world. and But you got to say Ruben Diaz, like you said, definitely defender of the year. He's come in high transfer fee. No one thought he'd live up to that expectation. Young, talented player from Portugal. Everyone knew he was a great player, but no one thought he'd be able to cut it this well in the Portuguese league. We talked about it earlier. Stepping in for Laporte and really taking over Laporte's role. No one expected him to just step in ahead of Laporte. Everyone said Laporte's just this fantastic center back that no one's going to step ahead of. He said he's number one. And Diaz has stepped in. He's taking John Stones under his wing. And they're both extremely young. But for Diaz to come in with this kind of confidence, this kind of leadership, and kick Laporte onto the bench and then bring Stones in, it's just been unbelievable from a guy his age, like you said, a new language barrier, a new country, a new city new team and it kudos to Pep Guardiola for coaching defensively for once in his career and actually coaching defend defenders and tactically playing defensively for once and it's been great to see and my defensive award winner would have to be Ruben Diaz so both of our awards are currently the same for both manager and defender and we will move on to the midfielder of the season award who do you got this is a difficult one for me. I don't know if there's a midfielder that necessarily stands out for me this season. Of course, there have been some very good ones. We have the likes of De Bruyne, Mason Mount, Declan Rice has had a very good season. Susex had a good season. Mason Mount has to have a shout in there as well, who's been very good for Chelsea. And it's very hard for me to pick one midfielder of the season. If I have to pick one, it might be Bruno Fernandez just because of how much he is the tempo as the leader of the Manchester United attack. And without him, it just isn't the same heartbeat and, and prowess in that Manchester United attack. Of course, Marcus Rashford's had a very good season as well, and he makes some very good runs down that left-hand side. But some of those balls and, and those decisive plays just aren't made with Bruno Fernandez. And I think that Manchester United attack is just so different with him in there, as we saw when he was added to the team last January. And there was just automatically such a difference in that Manchester United attack. And so I think Bruno Fernandez has to be my pick for midfielder this season. Well, football is supposed to be about argument, some bit of discussion, some controversy, and so far we've had none. We've currently agreed on all three of the awards, and that's kind of been how it's been in the Premier League this season. It's been kind of set in stone. I mean, you could have given it to a lot of different midfielders, but the stats Bruno's kind of put out this year has been unbelievable. 
And like you said, the leadership he's had with Manchester United, Manchester United for years have had no one in the dressing room, in the midfield to take the team by the scruff of the neck and say, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to take the team. I'm going to step up. The confidence Bruno shows, the leadership he has. Uh, we had pe penalty problems, many people know, before Bruno steps in, and he's came and basically doesn't miss a penalty. I don't think he has yet to miss a penalty at Manchester United. And he's scoring goals from free kicks, set pieces, open play, corner kicks, headers, volleys, whatever you want. And he's been unbelievable. I wouldn't say he's been head and shoulders above the rest. I'd say he's been on like he has been the midfielder of the season, but he's still been close to the likes of Jack Grealish. I think Jack Grealish being injured for two months has really hurt his likes for being a player of the season or midfielder season. Mason Mount, I think, give him more time under Tuchel and he wins that next year. Declan Rice, just that's what hurts you when you're a defensive midfielder over an attacking midfielder. And that's really sums it up, but that shows you a lot of English quality right there. And well, we've currently are the same so far for our three awards, and we're going to move on to the attacker of the year. I'll give my opinion first and who I think it's going to be. We'll mix it up a bit. I got Harry Kane winning it. I think it's pretty set in stone. It's pretty easy for this one to be called. You could leave this to the, if you really want to stretch it, you could say Mo Salah. Uh, Marcus Rashford, you could go give it to Callum Wilson from Newcastle if you really felt like it. But I think Harry Kane's definitely run away with it. As when he played with Jose Mourinho, Jose Mourinho coached 65 games. Harry Kane had 65 goal contributions. And for someone to say Kane wasn't scoring, wasn't doing this much for Jose and Jose's tactics, Jose's style, really can get sat down by those stats because he did do a lot under Jose. He was fantastic. And Vote Harry Kane's goals, and I don't know where Tottenham would be, really. Son, Sonny's been out with injuries quite a bit. He's never been consistently there for them. Yes, Harry Kane's been injured once in a while, but he's not as long as Sonny is. And when Kane plays, Kane scores. Kane's like Louis Lewandowski. And I would put probably Harry Kane as probably the best player and, like, best striker in the world right now. Just ahead of Lewandowski because he can set up goals, he can pass the ball, he can head head goals, volleys, whatever you want. Harry Kane's can do it, and Harry Kane would be my attacker of the season. Yeah, it definitely has to be the same for me. Harry Kane has just been an absolute dominant striker for Tottenham for so many years now, and that was no different again this season. His ability to score goals in every which way is, is something that just is very unmatched in the world of football. There's very few at his level. Of course, Lewandowski is there. Suarez, although not at the same level, and the likes of Benzema, there just really isn't that many number nines at his level. And there really isn't that many that have his ability to score and also his ability to create. Of course, assist, assist numbers this season really speak to that. It, he can get the ball in the back of the net, but he also makes some very good creative passes, creative plays, and good runs to create space for others that you just don't see from that many other strikers, even at his level. Uh, that, and that's one thing that I think for me really separates him from Lewandowski. As you mentioned, Harry Kane is arguably the best striker in the world right now above Lewandowski. And not that Lewandowski is a bad creator by any stretch or, or bad at creating for others, but I think Harry Kane just does that at another level that you don't see from too many strikers, specifically of this size, that can win those aerial bat battles, can win you those corners. And I think Harry Kane is, just has to be the attacker of the year for me in the Premier League this season. It's so dynamic and so multiversal multiversed in that Tottenham attack. He can do so many things for you in so many different ways. And so he has to be my Premier League attacker of the season. Well, so far we've had four awards handed out. And so far we have agreed on four awards so far this year. And we are going to, we have three awards left before we wrap up the show today. And we have the signing of the season. We have the player of the season, which we'll leave to last. And we have the young player of the season. We will currently move on to young player of the season because I feel like we're going to have the same player here again. We might, we might not. But I'm going to go with Phil Foden, young Philip, And he has really been a revelation this season, uh, playing at the false nine role, playing left wing, playing right wing, playing attacking midfielder for Pep Guardiola's new role. And he's filled in. He's learned from David Silva. He's learned from Kevin De Bruyne. He's learned from like Bernardo Silva. And he's been unbelievable, Phil Foden. He's, he looks like he could be the English Messi. He could be the next Wayne Rooney. I got Phil Foden winning the ball. and Personally, I think Phil Foden's going to win the ball and door in the next two to three years. I think if you're looking at 
uh, the best teenager, the best young talent right now. People will say Mbappe. People will say Haaland. Some biased Manchester United fans will probably say Mason Greenwood. But you got to say Phil Foden, I think. I think Phil Foden's so versatile on the pitch. He can play wherever you want him to. He scored unbelievable goals in big games against PSG, against Dortmund. He's done it in the Premier League in the big games. I think he's scored against almost every top six side probably by now. And like he's doing at such a young age is unbelievable. And for a team like Manchester City, for the things they're doing right now, it's, it blows me away for a kid his age. And to think I'm older than him is unbelievable. But Phil Foden gets my Young Player of the Season award. Yeah, Phil Foden has definitely been special for Manchester City this season. For someone at his age, he's had to play at so many different roles, as a cam role on the wing, as a false nine, as you've mentioned. So versatile and done so many great things for the Manchester City team. But we're finally going to disagree on a pick, and my young player of the year has to be Mason Mount for Chelsea. He's been so crucial to that Chelsea attack this season. He doesn't necessarily have that same type of quality of a Bruno Fernandes yet, but in terms of his impact on Chelsea's attack, it's very similar. Without him in that team, it just isn't the same. That ability to get the ball forward, to, to make those runs or feed the runs from those attackers, whether that's Simo Werner getting in behind with the likes of Christian Pulisic or Ziyech. There's no one else on that side who pushes the tempo and gets the ball up the pitch like he does and can pick the ball up from a bit of a deeper position and move it up the pitch. Without him, Chelsea really, really notices him without the pitch as far as pressing and getting the ball back or creating opportunities to score. And so I think for me, Mason Mount has to be the young player of the year. Well, we finally disagreed, and it came down to the young player of the year. And we have two more awards to give out, and maybe we'll disagree on two more. It'll be interesting. We're going to leave the player of the season for last, like I said, and we're going to move on to signing of the season. I can basically disagree that we're going to disagree on this one. Agree to disagree, but what do you have this one, signing of the season? This one for me is, is definitely got a few options. Uh, for me personally, I think this has to be between Ruben Diaz Edward Mendy and Thiago Silva. And the only reason that Edward Mendy and Thiago Silva get in in comparison with Ruben Diaz is due to the cost of the signing. Because, of course, Ruben Diaz has been the best defender in the Premier League this season and has had such a great impact. But the fact that Chelsea were able to pick up Edward Mendy for the price they did and how good he's been able to be after coming over from France and Thiago Silva to be able to pick up someone of his quality on a free transfer and have such an impact of leadership and poise and presence on that Chelsea back line that was really needed. And of course, just was even more amplified when Thomas Tuchel came in, someone that obviously Thiago Silva is very comfortable playing under. And it just was a very smooth transition. And of course, Ruben Diaz, we talked about, he's one of the greatest defenders in the Premier League this season and someone who has a very bright future ahead of him. And I think as far as an impact on winning this season, I think it has to be Ruben Diaz as the best signing of the season. Even though that hefty cost came in, that hefty cost has very much been worth it. And it's definitely brought a very drastic increase to the performance of that Man City defense. Someone that has raised the ceiling of that defense and definitely for years to come. Of course, Ruben Diaz and John Stones are still quite young. They have a lot of years ahead of them if they want to. And his impact on winning the season has definitely been a large reason why Manchester City have had a good of, as good of a season as they have. And I think he is the least replaceable of the three of Mendy and Thiago Silva within their current lineup. And so that is why I'm giving him the signing of the season. Well, this is the joys of football because we finally ag disagreed again. We went four times green. Now we're disagreeing once again. I am going with another free signing, like you said. It's all about the money and the cost once in a while, too. And I got two guys I want on my mind. It's Rafinha joining Leeds for Manet in France and Edinson Cavani joining Manchester United on a free. Cavani was kind of a late, kind of spur of the moment, kind of signing for Manchester United. No one really thought we were going to do it. We needed a striker. And deadline day, we went out and picked up Edison Cavani. Had to wait two weeks, quarantine. He's had some injury trouble throughout the season. When he has played, he's on 15 goals, five assists in, I think it's 32 games. And for a guy who's 33 years old, he's not in his prime anymore, but he's still doing fantastic. He's filled in for an in injured Anthony Martial. And he stepped right in. Anthony Martial is definitely our number two now. And when you look at a guy who's been on a free signing, he's 33. He's throwing Mar Marcus Rashford the ropes, Mason Greenwood the ropes. And the way he scores, he can use his head. United hasn't had a lethal guy scoring with their head in a while. And he's able to open up and move into the spaces instead of waiting for the ball to be put there. He goes into the space. 
and his movement off the ball, pressuring the back line, has been phenomenal. And Matt Schneider needed that. And then you got Rafinha, a guy who fits perfectly into Leeds' system, very fast, very attacking, doesn't stop running. He's been unbelievable, and he's already being talked about leaving for double the fee. But I'm going to have to be a bit biased here, and I'm 100% going to say Edinson Cavani has been my signing of the season. And to wrap up the show, we're going to go with our player of the season. It might have been mentioned already in our awards. Mine has. I'm not sure about yours. But who was your player of the season? This is a really tough choice for me. There's not one player that stands out to me this season that says, I've really carried my team to where we are. Now, no doubt there's some players that are definitely – very dominant on the respective rosters, the likes of Bruno Fernandes, the likes of Harry Kane, Ruben Diaz. There's some players that are very valuable to each team's success, and without them, you would see a very different lineup without it. But I think for me, it has to be Harry Kane, even though Tottenham def- don't necessarily have the record of someone that gets this type of award. They're not someone that's in now's Champions League spots. But the Tottenham Hotspurs team is just not anywhere near the same level without Harry Kane. From a scoring ability, from a creation ability, he just continues to do it year in, year out. And whenever Harry Kane is out of the lineup, Tottenham really suffer. And it's very obvious that they are very reliant on him. His scoring ability, his ability to create for those guys on the wing, specifically Son and whoever else is out there on any given night, whether that's Lucas or Bale or Deli Alley as more recently. And so I think it has to be Harry Kane for me as this year's player of the season. Well, i like to say we disagree, but we do not. I completely agree with you. It has been Harry Kane. And Tottenham go from never winning a trophy to getting two so far of this awards to getting an attacker and player of the season. And like you said, we can't talk about Harry Kane much more. He's been head and shoulders above the rest. The amount of goals he scored has just elevated Tottenham to a different level without him. You'd be using Vinicius at striker, and I don't know where they'd, they'd be mid-table of Arsenal. And they just wouldn't be the side that they are right now. Jose Mourinho would be there for as long as he was. And you would see a completely different Tottenham side. And you wouldn't have you would have a lot of money coming in if you didn't have Harry Kane. But the goals would be next to nothing. And it's gonna be interesting to see if Harry Kane leaves or where he goes after not being in the Champions League and Europa League. But he will be both of our player of the seasons. And that is going to be all for our show this week, everyone. That's going to be wrapping it up for another episode of Off the Pitch. And I can't wait to see you guys next week. It's been a great show. And I'm very happy you guys came again to watch the show. Thank you for being here every week, week in, week out. And can't wait to see you next week for another great episode of Off the Pitch. See you, everyone.